from Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. This is Radio Rhodesia broadcasting on the Mega, Micro, and Strato beams. We take you now to the Ethnical Museum of Antiquity at Kenya and our correspondent, Dinar Geb. Come in, Dinar Geb. Stand by, please. We are trying to get through. Radio Rhodesia to Dinar Geb in Kenya. Come in, Dinar Geb. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Some weeks ago, the workshop presented A Pride of Carrots, in which the novelist, Robert Nathan, described the planet Venus as it might appear to modern man. In the broadcast you are about to hear, Mr. Nathan describes our culture as it might appear to the men of 6,000 years from now. Based upon the story in the current issue of Harper's Magazine, here is Mr. Nathan's report on the Weans. This is Dinar Geb speaking from the Great Hall of the Ethnical Museum of Antiquity at Kenya. If my voice sounds a little strange to you, it's because I've become infected with the excitement of the scholars gathered here to receive the reports from the field expeditions on the Great West Continent. As you know, as part of the worldwide celebration of this astrophysical year of 7956 A.D., Teams of archaeologists have been working for months in the tumuli, or city mounds, of the uninhabited continent. Our staff correspondents are with them now, at the tumulus of Enyok, at Shaago, at Loose Angles, and at Pound Laundry. In just a moment, you'll hear them in person. But first, standing beside me at this microphone is Sra Bahan Bolek, Chancellor of Education and Curator of the Museum. Sra Bolek? Would you care to give our listeners some hint as to what discoveries may be announced today? No, Sir Geb, that would be cheating. Yes, I suppose it would. But I will say this. I believe we all agree that we have come to a great distance in understanding the Weans since the first artifacts were dug up in the city mound of Boxton, or as some prefer to pronounce it, Boston, nearly 200 years ago. They're the ones in this case, are they not? That's right. An ivory cross attached to some beads and a rusted iron wheel apparently designed to run along some kind of track. But alas, scarcely enough upon which to postulate a culture or project a civilization. And so, for more than a century, the great West Continent has kept its secret. But during that time, other discoveries were made, were they not? Oh, yes. From time to time, hunters, prospectors, and other adventurers returned from that deserted and forbidding land with fragments of scrolls but they were completely meaningless hieroglyphs until the discovery, some years ago, of the talking disk of Orleans. Orleans. That's the city mound at the extreme south of the Great West Continent, isn't it? Exactly. At the mouth of the immensely wide, dry river, the Misses. It was there, in the winter of 7940, that an expedition under my esteemed colleague, Han Shui, discovered the disk in an astonishing state of preservation. Since the disc of Orleans gave us our first indication of the identity of the people of we, I thought perhaps it would not be inappropriate to hear it now. An excellent idea. Is that the original you have there? Oh, my, no. This is a copy, a transcription of it. The original is never removed from the vaults of the museum, but it is a faithful copy. Listen. Now, Wayans knows, and Thans knows too, down deep in Thans' hearts, that Wayans ain't gonna let Thans tell us how to run things down here. We all can manage us and zone affairs, and no damn Yankee from the north is gonna tell us nothing. Well, that's mighty interesting, Sra Bolick. Mighty interesting. But what does it mean? Well, its actual meaning is obscure. But don't you realize that this human voice speaking to us from 6,000 years ago has uttered the sound of every letter symbol in all the glyphs and scrolls we have discovered. We know now, thanks to the great deductive scholarship of Sra Han Shui, that these people, who so often inscribed their scrolls with the letters U, S, A, referred to themselves as Weans. 
We did not know how to pronounce USA prior to the discovery of the disc of Orleans. Now we know that USANS is incorrect and the symbols USA are properly pronounced WIANS. Oh, thank you, Sra Bolek. I believe Sra Han Shui is at the city mound of Chicago right now with our Radio Rhodesia reporter, Hule Benneker. Take it away, Hule. Thank you, Dinar Geb. This is Hule Benneker at the Chicago excavation. And here is the distinguished professor and dean of the Advanced School of Primitive Languages of Kenya University, Sra Han Shui. <coughs> Greetings to my colleagues in the field as well as back home. This is indeed a great and proud day for me. I have found another disc. Just as the talking disc of Olin's gave us the secret of the Wiens language, I believe the singing disc of Shaago may indicate what the music of the Wiens was. There seems to be an inscription on the disc, Shrashui. What does it say? It is somewhat unclear. The nearest I can make out, it says, Blue Sue Shoe by Avis Paisley. Sold a million copies. What does it mean? I haven't the slightest idea, but let's listen to the music. Well, it's a one for the money, two for the show. For me to get ready now, go, can't go, but don't you step on my blue suede shoe. That's music? Oh, primitive, isn't it? Most rudimentary. Yes, but I'd hardly call it music. Hello, Hans Hello, French Hui. Can you hear me? Yes, who is it? Von Bullock at Kenya. Congratulations on your find. Oh, oh, thank you, my old friend. But I'm afraid you're mistaken. I'm uh, mistaken? Yes. That's not music. That's a religious ceremony. What? Yes. You have misread the inscription. It is not Avis Paisley. It must be Ephus Fresley. Fresley? Yes. Don't you remember my translation of the Enyok scroll regarding a great religious festival? I quote, And Fresley threw his head back and commenced, and did cause them by rock and roll to give out cries and screams loudly in the aisles and corridors, all in syncope. Unquote. Uh, you are right as always, Rabolek. I had thought it was music. I doubt if the Weans had any music. But your find is more important, for it proves they had a religion. And now, after that unscheduled but exceedingly interesting interchange between two long-time friends and associates, we continue our report on the Wiens from the far edge of the continent. Our next pickup is from Loose Angles, or as some translators prefer, Loose Ankles, at the edge of the Great Western Ocean. We take you there now. The next voice you will hear will be of our staff correspondent, Yash. El Tebi. Thank you, Hule Benneke in Chicago. This is Yush Er Tebi speaking to you from the excavations near the bleak brown hills of Loose Angles. And here beside me is the head of this particular expedition and the only woman scientist participating, Sres Besnef, the brilliant dean of advanced femininity at the University of Zagora. Hello there. I was most interested in the comments Sarah Bahan Bolek just made upon the religious significance of the find at the Chicago dig. Because out here, we too have come upon objects which have, for the first time, led us to believe that the Weans did indeed have a primitive religion. You are referring to the golden idols? Precisely. Repeatedly, in the kitchen middens of smaller communities surrounding loose angles, we have dug up these small gilded statues cast away among the pottery sherds and other refuse. The presence of so many of the golden fetishes indicates beyond a shadow of a doubt the existence of a considerable cult of Oscar, as our translation of certain scrolls prove the god's name to be. So for several months we've been searching for the temple of this god, particularly in this area of holy wood, which by its very name indicates that it was once a place of veneration and worship. I believe I can safely report to you today that we have unearthed the Temple of Oscar. It is not large as temples go, but it is distinguished from all the others in archaeological history in one important respect. You see, one expects to read the record of vanished races on the walls or frescoed ceilings of ancient temples. Here the record has been placed on the floor. The court is laid out in squares, and in each square are the imprints of feet, 
and hands and words. What do they signify? <laughs> my specialty is archaeology, not hieroglyphs. But my guess is that they were incantations to the god Oscar. The footprints were perhaps those of his priests, or perhaps sacrificial victims. Can you translate any of them? <laughs> well, I can try. Uh, here's one that says, Gloria Swan Song. Utter gibberish. Look at this one. There's the imprint of what looks like spectacles. Yes, that one says, Har Old Yoid. And there's one which looks like a, a large human nose. Jim, me, dur, and e. Hmm. Wouldn't that appear to indicate that these were sacrifices rather than priests? Oh, quite possibly. Certainly some of them at least appear to have been put through a humiliating ordeal to prove their devotion to this ancient god, Oscar. Thank you, Sres Beznev. And now this is Yush Er Tebi returning you to Dinargeb in Kenya. Back once more at the Great Hall of Kenya Museum. Shra Bullock has been joined by his colleague Shra Hap Bukong of the Libya Academy of Geophysical Sciences. Well, Shra's, what do you think of the field reports so far? Splendid, splendid. They substantiate my theory that the Weirns had at least a semblance of culture. Shra Bullock, to me, your theory is as unconvincing as your translation of the name of the Weirn capital. Pound laundry, indeed. Well, how else would you translate it? The glyph for washing means laundry, and the Wien glyph ton stands for a unit of weight, hence pound. Pound laundry. You couldn't say washing ton. It wouldn't make any sense. Though I must confess, we have never learned what was washed at pound laundry. Yes, well, Sraz, this is most interesting. But I'm informed that the expedition at the Enyok site is ready to make its report. So we take you now to the city mound of Enyok and our Radio Rhodesia correspondent, Cowley D. Cowley D speaking from the Enyok dig, a hundred feet below the surface. And believe me, Sraz and Sresses, in just a moment, you may be witnessing a great historic occasion. But here's the head of the Enyok expedition, Sra Obergerst Levy, to tell you about it himself. Thank you, Cowley D. We have been digging downward along this gallery for nearly a week, and at last we have arrived at a sealed door which may well be the entrance to a tomb. Above it is a glyph which translates phonetically as May Seize Bargan Basement. Seems to be meaningless. Nevertheless, we shall break through this door now and attempt to describe to you what, if anything, we find beyond. You may begin, men. Easy there, easy. But what's that? I don't know, Sralevi. As soon as the glass door was broken, a, a warning, perhaps. It's frightening. Oh, nonsense. I remember reading about what happened to the men who violated the tombs of the Egyptian pharaohs. Do you really think these weans can reach out across 6,000 years and harm us? Uh, no, Sra, not really, but... Still, one wonders. Proceed with the opening. Yes, Sra. Sra Levy, uh, what do you think you may find here? I have no idea. Throw a light down there. Well. Oh, what is it, Sra Levy? We shall see. Come. Oh. Yes. Yes, it is indeed a tomb. A tomb? Yes. Look. Will you look? On these racks here. Garments. Strange ancient garments. Coats of fur. Cabalistic symbols. One, nine, eight, reduced from two to five. Yes, and over there, tiny effigies. Tiny wagon. And here, bowls and cooking pots in perfect condition. There appear to be more chambers beyond. Is there any indication of sarcophagi or mummies? None so far, Sra. Mummies? Oh, yes, yes. You will recall that it was the custom of many ancient people to bury their kings along with their retinue and their household goods to assure them comfort and companionship in the next world. The Egyptians were most advanced in these matters... Up until now. Well, I'm afraid I don't follow you completely, Sir Alevi, and I'm sure our listeners would like a further explanation. Oh, dear me, dear me. We are on the air, aren't we? I'd quite forgotten. <clears throat> Excuse me, Sir and Stresses. 
I've been carried away by the amazing significance of this find. We have obviously penetrated the tomb of a great king, pharaoh, president, whichever translation you prefer, of the Weans. A ruler named May C. Excuse me, Sir Obergast Levy. You have found the mummy of May C. No, but in this next chamber, something most strange. Great eyes. Come. Great eyes? This is indeed a strange and wonderful sight, Sraz and Sresses. We are moving now from the main chamber of the tomb into a side chamber. And, and now our light beams are reflected by rows and rows of gigantic glass eyes, each in its own polished box. Uh, what are they, Sra Obelgerst Levy? I don't know. Each of them has a dial with numbers on it. Now, let me see. The dial is numbered from 1 to 13. Of mystic significance, no doubt. Ah, 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 he turns. Yes, but nothing happens. True, but we are not we -ins. These strange cyclopean boxes must have held great significance for them. Uh, see, Sra Levy, here on the wall is a glyph. Oh, oh, yes, yes. 1956, model, CBS, tell, e, viz, on. Utterly meaningless. But see the pictograph. A Wean and his she Wean sit before the box. And in the box is the face of another Wean. Yes. Indeed, then they were eyes of some sort. But did the Weans watch the eye, or did the eye watch the Weans? Uh, these are questions that only exhaustive research can answer. But, Sra Levy, can you hazard a guess why so many of these eyes have been put in the tomb of the potentate Macy? A guess, yes, but only a guess. He must have been a man so vain that even after death he wished to watch through these eyes what his people were doing. Or he wished through these eyes that his people could watch him. Who knows? Oh, who indeed. And now, Sra Obelgerst Levy, would you say that the discovery of this tomb of Macy overshadows in importance your unearthing of the great lintel and your translation of its message, which has indicated how the Weans met their end? Indeed I would. We had hoped to broadcast from the site of the temple, but of course we can't be two places at once. No, 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 we can't. But Sra Bahan Bolek, back home at the museum, already has my report on the temple's inscription. I'm sure he will be glad to give it. Frankly, I am unwilling to tear myself away from all these ancient splendors. I quite understand, Sra Levy. So this is Cowley D at the tomb of Macy in Enyok, returning you to the Kenya Museum and Dean Argeb. Thank you, Cowley D. and Sra Obelgerst Levy for an exciting remote. And now, Sra Bahan Bolek, I wonder if you'd be good enough to follow Sra Levy's suggestion. Suggestion? Yes, the report on the temple inscription at Enyok. Yes, of course. I must confess, I was so carried away with the magnitude of this newest find, I'd quite forgotten. Well, now for the other great discovery of Sra Obelgerst Levy. We now have definite proof of how the Weans perished. For weeks, Sra Obelgerst Levy has been excavating a great temple not far from where he has now discovered the tomb of May C. Last week, he gave me, in all confidence, the intelligence he has now asked me to divulge. On the lintel of this temple, he has found this fragmentary glyph, which he translates as follows. Snow, nor rain nor gloom of night, their appointed rounds. That is pretty obscure. Well, Swa Bukong, it is incomplete. Some of the hieroglyphs are missing. Their appointed rounds. What does that mean? Well, first, you must realize, Swa Bukong, that the R and the W are readily interchangeable in both the Hittite and the Hivite languages. You will then admit this may be so in the ancient Wean language. For the sake of argument. Very well, then. Instead of their appointed rounds, the phrase may well mean their pointed wounds, may it not? It might, but what about the rest of it? Well, the word nor can be considered north, and the word gloom could be translated doom, and night, fright. Then what have you got? The tragic story of the end of the Weans. The North Snow, the North Rain, the North Doom of Fright, 
their pointed wounds. In other words, invaders from the north have annihilated the inhabitants. That sounds pretty glib to me. Not when you remember the talking disc of Orleans. Let me recall those historic and prophetic words to you. Where's now what Austin's want? We all going to get it. And no damn Yankee from the north is going to tell us nothing. Notice the obvious reference to the enemy. Damn Yankee from the north. Oh, no, there's no question about it. North snow, north rain, doom of fright. Yes. The winds perished by the wounds of the north. But tell me this then, Srabolic. How did they have time to inscribe this account of their annihilation on a great marble temple before they were annihilated? But, but that's the obvious part of it. We know that Enyok was the most populous city in the great west continent. And why? Because at the end it was bursting with refugees. One by one, the great cities fell to the doom of fright from the north. Chargo, loose angles or ankles, Orleans, pound laundry. Enyak, an island bastion, was the last to fall. Knowing the fate of the others, the Wiens built this temple and inscribed upon its great lintel their fate so that we, who came later, might understand what happened to them. Yeah. It sounds reasonable. But there is one more question. What is that? We have read much in their scrolls of a city more important than any of those we have excavated. Milltown? Yes, Milltown. What about Milltown? Our expeditions have searched and searched, but they have found no trace of a city called Milltown. Strange. Exceeding strange. Yes. I dare say we will never know anything more about the Wiens, but we now know enough to evaluate them as a minor culture with a rudimentary religion devoted to a god named Oscar who was worshipped by rocking and rolling. They enjoyed their brief moment in history, established their hegemony in the land of We by killing off the aborigines. They evidently built their empire such as it was by the sword, and when the sword rusted, they died by another's, even as Egypt and Babylon and Greece and Rome, leaving behind them curious city mounds, a splendid tomb, and no music. Sick, transit, gloria, weans. Thank you, Srabahan Bolek. And thanks also to our scientists, archaeologists, commentators, and announcers who have made possible this Report on the Winds, the greatest single event of this astrophysical year of 7956 A.D. This is Dinar Geb speaking to you from the Great Hall of the Ethnical Museum of Antiquity at Kenya, returning you to the main studios of Radio Rhodesia. <laughs> CBS Radio Workshop is produced and directed in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Report on the Weans by Robert Nathan appears in the current issue of Harper's Magazine. The radio version was written by Mr. Robeson and Fran van Hardesfeldt. The scientists and commentators of 6,000 years from now included June Foray, Byron Kane, Dawes Butler, Edgar Barrier, Jay Novello, Joe Kearns, Joe DeSantis, and Hans Conrad. Next week, from New York, the CBS Radio Workshop will present The Growth of Our Nation, the story of the development of America told in sound effects. Be with us then, won't you? Every Sunday evening, current events come into sharper focus as prominent Washington personalities are interviewed by a battery of top-flight reporters on the CBS public affairs feature Face the Nation. Here, Face the Nation over most of these same stations tonight. Stay tuned for Suspense, which follows immediately over most of these same stations.